Sometimes code can determine the number of times it needs to repeat a block of code. In some cases, you might want to repeat a block as an integer variable iterates between one value and another value. In other cases, you might want to repeat the code for each element of a collection of objects, like I said, for each file on your hard drive or something. Imagine you want to repeat a block of code as a variable takes on all the values between 1 and 100. What are you going to do? Are you going to add a separate line for each case? When x is 1, do this. When x is 2, do this. When x is 3, do that. It gets awful boring. Instead, like most languages, both Visual Basic and C Sharp, well, pretty much every .NET language, provides a way to loop through a range of integer values. You can increment or decrement the looping variable. You can increment or decrement by one or by some other value. The for loop allows you to run code repeatedly as the integer variable takes on a value between two endpoints, allows you to increment the looping variable by one, minus one, or any other integer value, allows you to skip looping variable values by incrementing the looping value by two or by three or by some other value. And you can loop backwards by setting the loop increment to minus one or any negative integer. You can nest loops, providing support for multidimensional data. Let's look at some examples that show off the for loop. I'll start with letter L, the simple for loop one example. And here we go. Couldn't be easier than this. We'll dim i as an integer. And while i, wait a second, this is a while loop. This is the hard way of doing it. For i as an integer is less than or equal to 10, we'll print out the number, we'll increment i, and we'll loop back around. And we'll keep doing this until i becomes greater than 10. OK, you'll notice, by the way, I put this into a try catch block. And the only reason I did that was so that I could use the same variable, i, a little later in my code. So don't worry about the try catch block. It has nothing to do with anything except having a block to encapsulate the scope of one variable, i in this case. I could have used j down here or some other letter for my looping variable. I wanted to use i. OK, here's the same exact code, the same behavior, without the while loop without declaring a variable, without incrementing i myself. It just works. For i as integer equals 0 to 10. That says i is an integer variable which will take on all the values from 0 to 10. I'm going to print out in the console window each of those values. And you see I end up with the numbers 0 through 10 listed twice, once using a while loop, once using a for loop. Again, the syntax is pretty easy. If we look at another example, here at m, you see I can iterate through from 0 to 10. I can go step 2. And in this case, i will take on all the values, i the variable, will take on all the values from 0 to 10, starting at 0, skipping up by 2s. If you don't specify, as in the previous example, it skips up by 1. Here we'll go 0, print that out. We should get 0 printed out, and then 2, and then 4. So it's going up by 2s. OK, so we got 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. All right, this one is going to go from 10 to 0, step minus 1. It's going backwards. So 10, then 9, then 8, and so on. 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, and we're out of there. Okay wasn't nearly as exciting without the high-pitched voice. And um, you'll notice that the numbers here, it's important that you get them in the right order. If you're using a step of minus 1, the first number has to be greater than the second number, or the loop will never execute. Now, you don't have to declare the looping variable inside the loop like I did here. You can declare it outside the loop. Dim j is integer outside the loop. And the reason to do that is if you want to be able to use that looping variable after the loop. So I'm going to have j go from 5 to 10, and we'll print out 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. What is j now? Well, let's see. We can actually see it here. I don't have to hold any mystery about it. j is 11. So after the loop, the looping variable is 1 greater than the final value it's checking for. So in this case, j is 
11 once the loop has finished. Let's try one more example using four loops. And in this case, let's do a nested loop. Here, I'm going to take i as integer from 1 to 10. And for each value of i, 1, then 2, then 3, and so on, I'm going to have j iterate from 1 to 5. That means i will be 1, j will be 1, then 2, then 3, then 4, then 5. i will be 2, then j will be 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Then i will be 3, and j will be, again, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So if we go through and print out at each point the value of i times j, I'm using console.write here, and I'm using as my placeholder not just 0 as in other examples, but 0, 4. That comma 4 performs a formatting of the value and making it write justified in four spaces on the screen. It's a convenient way to pad values out so they line up neatly on the screen. So here, we'll print each one out, and i is going to be still 1, j by now is 3, and actually, if I go to the debug window and go to the locals window, I should be able to watch those as I work through my code. Let's pin this down. Here we go. As I loop through, you'll see j takes on 1 through 5. We're done. Now i takes on the next value, and j takes on 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And i takes on the next value, and so on. And we end up with this output are multiplication tables. 1 through 5 times 1 through 10 gives a nice table here. Now obviously, you could do this for multiple dimensions. I couldn't really display more than two dimensions on the screen, but you can nest these loops as deeply as you like. The innermost loop gets called the most, because it gets called once for each level of the loop containing it. But you can nest loops as deeply as you like. For loops come up a lot when you're working with the .NET framework because there's a number of methods that return a set of objects. For example, the getDrives method of the driveInfo class returns an array of driveInfo objects. Now, we haven't really studied an array, but it represents multiple objects of the same type which you can index into by position using a numeric index. Let's look at an example that demonstrates this functionality. I'll choose option O, list drives with for loop. I'm calling the getDrives method of the driveInfo class, and that returns back to me an array of driveInfo objects. And I indicate that by putting this open close parenthesis at the end of the type indicator. So drives is actually an array of driveInfo. Not a single driveInfo, but a bunch of them. If I go investigate that, I can see that the length is 3. They're numbered 0, 1, and 2. And if I expand each one, C, well, there's some information about drive C. Drive D is a CD-ROM drive, and it's got a, a DVD in it or something. So at this point, I want to loop through them all. I'll let I, as integer, go from 0 to drives.length minus 1. Why is that? Well, the drives.length is 3. I want to go from 0 to 2, 0, 1, 2. That's how they're indexed. So I'll go from 0 to 1, then 2, and I'll get the specific drive I care about. Drives i, in parentheses, says get me that specific drive by position. i is currently 0. That'll hand me drive number 0 from this collection of drives. That's this one. OK. If the drive is ready, we'll print out some stuff. Well, a isn't ready. We skip it. We come along drive 1 is ready, and we get some information. We're going to display the drive name and the total free space on the screen. We'll do the same for drive D. Drive D is a DVD, and it's returning no bytes free, because that's what DVDs do. And so you'll see here we have drive C with its bytes free and drive D with its bytes free. We've iterated through a collection of, an array actually, of drive info objects using a for loop. But you had to keep track of the beginning number, 0, and the ending number, 2, and make sure you didn't go out of bounds. 
Wouldn't it be easier if you could say, just go run this code for every item in the array? And that's our next example using a for each loop. You can use the for loop to iterate through all the elements of a data structure. You just did that. It requires you to keep track of the endpoints and to manage the index yourself. You can also use a for each loop. In that case, the language handles the details for you. You'll be amazed how much easier this is. Let's take a look. I'll choose option P, list drives with for each loop. And in this case, the code is pretty much as simple as it could be. For each drive as drive info, so we're specifying the type, in driveinfo.getDrives. So getDrives returns some sort of data structure that allows us to iterate through each element one at a time. That's what for each does. It allows us to look at each one in turn. In turn, the drive variable takes on the value of each of the drives. It points to each drive info object one at a time. So we'll start out with drive A. If the drive is ready, well it's not, so we go on. Now we move on to the next drive. This is drive C on my machine. In this case, we'll print out the number of bytes free. Now we move on to the next drive, drive D on this machine. And the bytes free. There are no more drives. We're done. I didn't have to know how many there were. I didn't have to retrieve a drive given its index. This just takes care of the whole thing. One at a time, drive takes on or points to each drive in the value returned by the getDrives method. What could be easier than that? The for each loop seems like it's a much simpler deal than using for, so why would you ever use a for loop? Well, there's two important reasons to choose the for loop. If you need a nested loop with two loops inside each other where you're keeping track of which item you're on, it's easier to use a for loop. And if you need to traverse the data in reverse order from the end back to the beginning, you really don't have an option. In that case, you have to use a for loop because for each only moves forward through your data. Why would you ever want to traverse your data backwards, you ask? Well, here's a good example. Imagine you want to work through a collection and remove each item from a collection. Maybe you're keeping track of all the open forms in a Windows app and you want to close each form. If you close them moving forward through the collection, imagine the problem with numbering. As you remove items, they renumber. Removing from front to back would just break the collection. So imagine you have five things open, numbered 0 through 5. You close number 0. What was number 1 becomes 0 and so on, and now you close number 1 because you're iterating through forward removing items. And the for each loop does the same thing internally with the numbering. It's still doing the same thing. So now remove item 1. We're left with three items and they're numbered 0, 1, and 2. Now we remove item 2. Now we're left with two items and they're numbered 0 and 1 and things get all messed up and the loop breaks and the code's not going to work. The answer is we have to do backwards traversal to do that. And why can't you use for each to remove items then? Because most collections can't handle dynamic resizing during a loop. They just keep renumbering their items and the for each enumerator just uses an index to move on to the next item. Well, the indexes have been changed because you remove something and life isn't good. The answer is if you want to remove all the items from a collection, you generally have to iterate using a for loop from the end back to the beginning, removing each item in turn. VB includes a few more ways you can jump about in your code. There are exit statements that allow you to exit from a for, while, or do loop. There's the go to statement, which lets you jump unconditionally to a location, giving you the possibility of creating totally unreadable and unmanageable code. There's also the continue statement, which allows you to go back to the top of a loop and execute the next iteration, leaving the current iteration wherever you are in the code. These exit statements in VB are pretty powerful. You can explicitly exit an executing loop. There's exit for, exit while, exit do, and this is pretty cool. If you have nested loops of differing types, you can exit from any of the loops at any level. 
Now the loops do have to be of different types for this to work. We have an example that shows this off. For example, if you have nested for, while, and do statements, you could, from the middle of the do, say exit for, which would take you to the outermost for loop and exit it. Pretty cool. Let's take a look at examples that show off these features. Let's choose option Q to exit a for each loop. Here you'll see we have the same sort of loop you've seen already. In this case, if the drive is ready, we do something, but if the drive isn't ready, we use the exit for statement to exit this for each loop. Exit for gets us out of the loop and goes to the line of code following the loop, which in this case is getting out of the sub. All right, so exit for allows you to break out of a for loop. Let's try a go to statement. I'll choose option R. And in this case, it's kind of an odd example and points out one of the few cases where the go to statement is really useful. And that is if you have multiple nested loops. In this case, I'm going to let I go from 1 to 1,000, and J go from 1 to 1,000, and K go from 1 to 1,000. And in the middle of that loop, we'll get a random number from 1 to 1,000 and store it into a variable. If the value is 357, some magic number I pulled out of my hat, then we'll get out of here. Now we could do this a number of different ways, but here the simplest way is if we get 357, just go to exit here. That label is down here, and we're out of all the loops in that case. We just jump directly out of the loops and back out to the next line of code. So that's a simple way to say if we get 357, get out. If we don't get 357, we increment this sum variable so that when we do get out, we know how many iterations we went through, just for interest's sake. Let me try it. Okay, let's try it again. I'm not single stepping through because you don't want to watch that iterate through 252 times, and so on. But when we do finally hit 357, we get out and jump to our label, exit here, and run the code that we find there. Well, what's the alternative? If you don't like using GoTo because you've heard it's bad or evil or will cause all your hair to fall out, then what do you do? In that case, let's try option S. Option S is the same example, except this time we don't use GoTo. We're going to, at the point we find 357, exit the for loop. Well, we can exit the for loop, but how do we know to exit the next for loop and the one outside that? To do that, we have to keep track of whether we want to exit the loops. And we have an exit now variable as Boolean set to be false when we declare it. So if we hit this value, 357, we set exit now to be true, and then exit the for, which takes us to the line of code after the end of this loop. So the line of code after the end of that loop is, well, didn't need to check for it here, that's extraneous. But down here, at the end of our loop, we have if exit now, then exit for. We check exit now, and if we get it, we exit the for loop. We actually need that down here at the end of this loop. Okay, let's try it again. S, run it full speed. But either way, we're getting the same kind of results because we're exiting the loop once we find the value, but it requires a little more effort. So in my eyes, this is really the only type of situation where I think go to is probably a good idea, and that is when you have multiple nested loops and you want to be able to exit from those loops without having to keep track of this exit now variable. Just makes it a little easier. Don't overuse go to, it can get in the way.